Welcome everyone to the 2021 Arizona International Film Festival. This is the Euro Filmmakers Film Panel. My name is Stacy Cochran and I'm going to be moderating the panel, which means I'm going to try to stay out of the way as much as possible, but keep the conversation rolling. If you're watching live over on Facebook or if you're picking this up through the uh, Zoom feed elsewhere, feel free to post your questions if you have questions in the Q&A throughout the conversation. I could use a little assistance if you've got some questions uh, for Raffaello or Tom, Tomas. Um, and we might have a couple of other filmmakers joining us in a, in a few minutes here as well. So let's get started. Uh, Raffaello, if you would introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background, your experience and your film, most importantly. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Raffaello Decretola. I'm a, a first generation Italian brought up in London. Um, I spent a lot of years in the United States uh, on the West Coast and the East Coast, actually. And uh, my film is uh, Transparence, a love story, um, which began as a sort of uh, experimental piece on the subway one night here in London. And a year later, it expanded itself into a feature length film, sort of half accidentally and half based on a script that I'd written 10 years beforehand and I sort of moulded it into present day so that I was able to shoot it in the here and now without much of a budget. I'm curious as a follow-up question, you said it began as a kind of experimental film in a subway, so tell us more about that. I say subway as in the underground, the, the London underground. Um, I'd been thinking about this piece for a few years and I'd been making a few shorts and um, um, I'd met this actress uh, immediately I thought oh, cause in the back of my mind I thought she could be really interesting for this character that I'd been thinking a lot about um, and so I asked her to come down this poet had asked me to film something with him and his poetry on London South Bank which is where the big wheel is and I asked her to come down and said, do you want to come down? I've got some ideas for this poet piece. And I shot a little black and white piece on a DSLR. And she, she was really engaging to watch and have the, say, the sensibility I've, I've been thinking about for this character, sort of innocent, but, but curious. And uh, then I, I moved on to shooting a, a scene. We went to a, my cousin's apartment. I'd written one. I pulled one scene out, I kind of changed it a bit and, I, and we shot it one night and I went in the edit suite, cut it together and from that moment on I just tried to construct a whole piece around it by going back to a script that I'd written and moulding it into today to see if it could work and I think it sort of um, eventually grew to its own uh, piece uh, out of a few roots from different places, if that makes sense. It really does. So just tell us the actress's name originally and, and how did you connect with her originally? Uh, her name is Amelia Johannesson. She's, she was from Norway and she'd been working in London as an actress and uh, she, she basically lived in the same area and, and we bumped into each other as you kind of do sometimes with different actors and stuff and immediately the conversation starts like that and I run a sort of improvisation workshop anyway so I'd invited her to come down to that and um, yeah the rest of the cast who are just as amazing were people that I've, I've worked with in the past mostly and I uh, when I'm thinking about a character I'm always thinking about an actor I'd like to, to use and then I ask them if they'd be interested in and, and bring them into it. So it's the same principle with all the actors. <clears throat> Having started as an actor, really, I kind of know or feel I know anyway what actors are driven by and, and, I, and they need to be inspired, obviously, as I need to be inspired. And uh, so once I'm able to find inspiration in them and myself, then I know something's going to develop and I'm able to write for them. That's phenomenal. And I want to ask a follow-up question about improv, the improv workshop, but first let me bring in Tomas. Uh, so Tomas, tell us a little bit about your background, your film, uh, and, 
and how, how it began for you. Hi, my name is Tomas and I'm a director from Poland. And my film Ondine is um, quite a personal film uh, because um, it's basically the story of a person who is suffering uh, CCHS, uh, which is a very rare disease. And its common name is Ondine's curse. Uh, and it's derived from, uh, from the myth about uh, Ondine, who was a uh, uh, who was a nymph, water nymph. She fell in love with the mortal, but when he betrayed her, she put a curse on him that he would breathe only as long as he remembered about this. And this disorder, CCHS, is uh, the thing that the CCHS patients stop breathing when they fall asleep and they have to be connected to external devices, mostly ventilators because otherwise they would die. And this is a very personal story for me because my son suffers from, from the disorder. And um, this film is a kind of extension of my previous film, my short documentary, Our Curse, uh, which I made uh, when my son was born in 2000. Like I started recording it in 2010. It was released in 2013. Uh, and it was a short documentary about our first few months living with our uh, with our son. So this is kind of um, follow up to that subject. We, we, we well, our, our documentary was very like um, classical raw documentary filming us and our emotions, uh, how we faced uh, the new reality. And this time we decided to fantasize a bit. Our main character is older. He is 22 years now, years old. We somehow detached from our own personal story and we tried also to combine it with the myth about Ondine and make a kind of modern version of, of Ondine's curse. So this is the That's background. Phenomenal. Yeah, I've, I've got to ask a follow-up question. As a filmmaker as you're, and as a creative, as you're processing this disorder that has so affected your life and it has affected your, your son. Um, is it, can you describe how doing a documentary film in contrast to a fictional narrative film affects how you process and make sense and meaning of, of, of the disorder and what it means to you and how to move forward in life? Well, I must say that this documentary thing, like it, it really saved us somehow. Now, I was then uh, at film school when my son uh, was born. And, you know, like when such things happen, you really think that this is the end of the world. Nothing, nothing's good gonna happen and, anymore. And somehow because it, uh, I had to do it for school, I started recording him and ourselves. And then I met some people who encouraged me to continue uh, this recording because they found that it's, it's really very sincere material. And, and really it helped us a lot to go through it. You know, we, we just kept recording this and we didn't know what's going to happen out of it, but it helped us really go through these worst periods of, of our life at that time. You know, it kind of, uh, our because very, we made this documentary only by ourselves, me and my wife. So there was no crew involved. So it was very personal thing. And the camera became somehow our, you know, uh, therapist, you know, we could talk our fears and everything uh, to, towards the camera. And so, yes, it, it really helped us a lot. And uh, it was amazing how many good things came afterwards because the, th the film was really successful worldwide. But I, I'm not talking really even about the success, but because CCHS is a very rare disease, really not many people know about it. There are about uh, 1,200 cases worldwide. And uh, with such disease, uh, disorders, it's very important, like the knowledge about them is very important. You know, when, when a child is born to diagnose it really early, Otherwise, these children just would die or would have, you know, defects, brain defects because of lack of oxygen, you know, of, uh, not, not uh, efficient breathing. So thanks to this film, really um, many th thing, uh, things happen around CCHS community worldwide, you know, like in the US, they, they said that, uh, you know, um, 
the interest in CCIHS community was so huge that uh, they created CCIHS Foundation to gather funds to find the cure for CCHS. You know, we also made foundation in Poland. Many people contacted with us telling that thanks to our film, they child was diagnosed with CCHS because like it, it happened that it's not such a real disease as everyone knows. It's not, not many people know about it. So really it brought lots of good thing. And it's really amazing that something, you know, which we started uh in one of the worst periods of our life you know and we ended up in you know in la and on a red carpet because it was oscar nominated in 2015 so it was really amazing thing and it's amazing power of, of film and documentary and how it can you know help you process things but um we felt that we didn't say enough about the cshs and also throughout the years we learned more about the syndrome and about living with this disorder about living with any you know disabilities you know we got in touch with young people all their living with their cchs with their parents talk without about the problems they face and uh, therefore we decided to make on dean you know like a follow-up something which is kind of you know mixture of our hopes fears connected with the, with this disorder and we are also supported because uh, by many CCHS associations who are waiting for this film, you know, to, to continue talking about, about this disorder. So, but the, the process in fiction was completely different somehow, although it was very weird experience to come back again to this topic, especially that, for example, one of our locations was our own apartment where we uh, where we used to film uh, our curse so it was really amazing that we came back there but now with a fictitious character but uh, with the same topic but of course like documentaries are much more intense and you know that i remember editing was a nightmare for me you know for example i had to you know postpone it you know after recording i had to wait like a few months therefore like the film was ready I filmed it in 2011, 10, and but the film was ready like two years later because, you know, I somehow had to, you know, wait a bit, you know, until dive into the story again. So working with the fiction, you know, it's it's, it's, it's something completely different. It gives you more um, detachment, you know, because it's abstract story. It's not so closely connected with you. So many follow-up questions I want to ask. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. story. Thank you for sharing. I do want to bring in our other panelists as well, Sevgi and Chris. Uh, if you would introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your film. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you very much for including us in your uh, film festival. We are so happy. Um, I am Sevgi Hirschwasser. I am a writer, director, and editor uh, of Top Rap Film, and. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? I'm <laughs> Chris um, uh, Hello, Stacy. Hey, Tomas. Hello, Rafael. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm so impressed from listening to you guys. So I, I just uh, want to listen more. <laughs> so I'm um, a little bit stunned about this. Um, crazy stories were very, very sad and intense. And yes, I'm happy to be here. And we are happy to be here and to be part of this uh, thing. Um, he's a uh, he's a cinematographer and the co-producer of the film, and he is my husband. Uh, Top Top Rock is my first feature film, and um, we made the movie together. I didn't study before film, and I was going to make this film kind of like with my feelings. I started to de develop around of the world some uh, stories. Uh, I got inspiration from true life stories and I wanted to add this inside of my story and a little bit of uh, where my grandparents are coming. Uh, I wanted to add this town inside and at the end we made our uh, first feature film. Well, tell, tell us a little bit more about that. So there's a connection to where your grandparents came from with the story. So. Yes. Uh, actually, part of the story from my cousin and he is acting in, acting in the movie also. He had a little bit dramatic background uh, also. It touched me very much. And I wanted to take this as inside of my first feature film. Maybe it was a little bit too risky to make uh, slow pacing and um, dra dramatic movie at the beginning, but I was feeling close myself to make that kind of uh, start as a first feature film. 
um, what else I can add? <laughs> I don't know. I think we have to come inside of this. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. Thank you for sharing. Um, it's very nice to meet you and thank you for being a part of the panel. I'm super <laughs> grateful. So I'll return back to Raffaello. You mentioned uh, that you met this actress through an improv workshop. And I've been, so I teach at the University of Arizona. I have a, a novel that has just been adapted to film. Uh, filming was at Cinecita Studios in, in, in Italy this past fall. And so I'm, I'm totally new to all this in many ways. I'm very excited to learn from, from you. But I'm working with this student this semester who at the University of Arizona is very interested in how to connect with other creatives, right? And how to connect, and she's a visual artist and wants to become an animator and these sorts of things. And, and I have been giving her advice to say, connect with the other artists in your college of fine arts, right? From there, you'll build some collaborations. So Raffaello, if you can talk a little bit about how the first, you, I think you mentioned that you had come to a film school experience as well, but then this improv workshop and how that was kind of a creative place to network and, and find other creatives. Yeah, uh, it was the one thing that I felt lacked in my life as an actor 15 odd years ago. And so me and a few friends created a once a week uh, place in central London, Soho, where we started to invite actors that we'd worked with or just come across. And we really, most of them had worked professionally and some hadn't, it didn't really matter, but it was mostly some of them that had, had worked for a while and then work had fallen away from them. And it was a place for them to reconnect with their, their selves as artists and not be judged. So the improv is really good at that, immediately sort of frees you up. It's harder to, internally feel like you're making mistakes in improvisation, I think. And the, the discovery process as an actor, for me, I always use it, whether I'm working with text or not. I always go into improvisation to find the character and then move back into the text. So anyway, I'm going off tangent, but yeah, basically it was a great place to work with different people. Uh, we, it was effectively an actor's gym and a place that you would go to the gym to work your body out. We would go to this improvisation workshop once a week and try things out. And slowly I, I sort of devised the film from that whole process, which was my first feature film called Flynn the Movie. Um, and I, I, it was a hell of a nightmare in, in, the, in the edit, but I think it was worth it. It sort of, uh, I kind of effectively rewrote the script in the edit as a lot of people do, but obviously with improvisation, to get to the bolt of the scene. Sometimes with improv, it goes sideways and you have to sort of hone it. But yeah, I do enjoy it as an actor. I think it's a very important tool and it helps me connect as a filmmaker with actors because, you know, I feel like I can loosen them up a bit before they get into the, the material. And um, yeah, so it's, it's a tool that I've always used as an actor anyway, so I use it in, in making my films. I love it. Let's talk a little bit more, uh, Tomas, and let me bring you into this conversation about working with actors. Uh, and, and how did you, what was that process like auditioning or finding the, the, the right team to work with on your film? I hate auditioning. <laughs> I hate auditioning. I think like, uh, I don't know, maybe I don't know how to do it, but I think like we put people in such a stressful, like uh, unnatural situation. So I really prefer somehow to observe actors like in films or in theater, I think like it, it, it's the best thing, you know, uh, because in theaters you can uh, discover actors who are not very popular, well, well known in, in, the cine in cinema. And I somehow only rely on our gut feeling, you know, and it was in case of all three actors. All of them, you know, I've seen them send and said like, this might be this person. And then when I met with them, I talked with them and I knew that they should play the roles. And I was really happy that I uh, chose the, the ones because like they were amazing actors to work with. 
uh, most of them were not very well known and then now furious later they are because i've made like recorded made this film like in uh, the premiere was in 2019 but i shot it in two years earlier so in the meantime all these actors became quite well known actors in poland so i think i had good inner feelings but this is the way you know i'm some i i have a vision of who would be the protagonist in my head and i try to you know observe people and find the perfect ones and also, also ask other fellow directors and filmmakers because everyone has its own experience with different actors and, and you had mentioned the process was very different with the documentary film which did i hear you correctly was an oscar winning film or was an oscar nominated film oscar nominated oscar nominated film uh first i gotta ask you about that how did you find <laughs> out that it was nominated for an oscar what was that moment like? Take us through that moment. <laughs> uh, well, the whole thing was pretty absurd, you know, because it was very, you know, low budget film, which we made you know, only, you know, by, we had only Canon, uh, Canon 5D, you know, we shot it together with my wife. And, uh, you know, I just won Best Documentary at Aspen Shorts Fest. And I sent, you know, the form to Oscars. And this was for me like very weird thing, you know, to fill this Oscar form. And to be honest, I completely forgot about it. <laughs> and then I got an email that, you know, it's on the short list. So then, of course, all the buzz was and everyone in Poland reminded themselves that there is such a weird documentary, our curse. So then everyone became interested about it. And, you know, of course, it was a big a big uh, day in Poland when we are listening to the nominations, and it was also the night uh, the this edition where three Polish films were nominated. It was the one where uh, I, uh, Ida, the Polish film, won the best foreign picture, and there were also two short documentaries, Polish documentaries, nominated at that time. But it was really the, it was a weird time, you know. It was not planned. We didn't think, you know. I to be honest, I even didn't know such a thing exists as Oscar qualifying festivals you know i just submitted to aspen and then it went you know it was just but it's a all, good time it was we, a very we all love time. hearing those sorts of stories we love hearing that story yeah, <laughs> yeah it, 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 it's it was really amazing because you know uh, you hear all these stories and us also now know many stories about you know how people work to have the film Oscar nominated, you know, how much amount of work and money is put in that, you know, and how stressful it is for everyone. For us, it was, you know, it kind of, we didn't plan, it just happens. So therefore, I think we could really purely enjoy it. We didn't have any expectations. We just went there. It was kind of adventure of a lifetime, you know, um, and, you know, it was really, really great time we had at the Oscars and a really great feedback. We met lots of great people there and it was really an amazing, amazing time. And I love LA. <laughs> and I'm curious too, if at all that critical reception that people were interested in, they were supportive, they loved the, the documentary. How much, if at all, did that affect your decision to revisit the subject matter in more depth and to get a little even more creative with it. Um, did that support that you saw from the film community matter at all? Or would you have gone in that direction regardless of how successful the documentary was? No, to be honest, it was a bit opposite because like many people, because my, my thing, film is not a feature, it's a short, but it's a very long short because it's 40 minutes long. Uh, and many people ask me why I don't want to make, why don't you make a feature out of, out of this uh, script? Because it could have been a feature, uh, but I felt the inner feeling, I didn't want to make my first feature out of this subject, to be honest, you know? I thought that I don't, use, I don't want to overuse this personal story, you know, just for my professional purpose. But I had this, at the same time, me and my wife, we felt this inner feeling that we had to tell the story, you know? Uh, so this was kind of purely not, it's something different. We, we rather had expectations from uh, CCIHS communities all over the world to make a continue, uh, film about CCIHS again, and not from the filmmaker's point of view. Like for me, it's, I, I would never go that way. 
But to be honest, it, it went straight from us. We really felt that this is the story we want. We didn't put, you know, dot at the end of the sentence. We have to do it just to... My intention was that I won't be able to make any other film until I make this one. So uh, I made on Dean and I am now working on another project, not CCI test related, but no one knows what will happen in the future. <laughs> It's such a good point. Uh, and as, a, as creatives, I know we all can kind of think about and can relate to there's this balance between wanting to better understand and empathize with a particular topic, especially if you're doing kind of serious uh, social drama of some sort, and, and yet not being exploitative either of the subject matter, especially something that's so personal to you. And um, I wonder if the screenwriting process is a place to kind of figure out if the story resonated with you as you, as you started to move into, uh, into Andine. Was that part of the process was just seeing, well, what, what happens when you start writing the script and how do you feel about it? Or was the decision already made before you began writing a script that this was the direction you wanted to go? Well, <clears throat> it was funny, like my film was somehow, uh, mm, I met a person who, who, who for me was, you know, uh, on which I based like the main protagonist because I really met uh, one CCIS person, 22 years old, who somehow was ashamed of her syndrome and she didn't tell anybody about this. It was kind of her secret. And this really fascinated me a lot in terms of like, how is it possible to live in such a lie somehow, you know, uh, being a grown up person. And somehow I felt that I have to do everything so that my son would not follow that kind of way, that he would live in a kind of open way about this syndrome. But it gave us, you know, the possibility to further investigate the, the, sub the topic. And we, we talk with many people because, in, especially in the US, because there's the biggest um, community of CCIHS people and talked about the problems there, you know, themselves versus the other world, how, the, how other people perceive them. And that's for every one of them, it was not so obvious to, because this is very weird disease, you know, it's a kind of that mostly no one, you cannot see it from the outside, you know? So you function, you can function as a normal person, but then you have this something that at night you just kind of have to plug yourself, otherwise you can die. So it's a very weird syndrome and it's, it's also not so easy for them to fully express this and talk openly, especially when you, I don't know, fall in love with someone and whether you should say it from the first time or wait a bit. And I met a, a, one girl said that at the beginning she was afraid to tell about it. Now for her, it's like the best test, you know? At the beginning she said she, said she has CCHS. If somebody doesn't accept, then okay, I don't have to waste my time on him. But it also was a process for her to come to this, uh, this thing. Uh, so based on that, me together with my wife, we started to write the script. We wanted to write the script from the perspective of, of a person having CCHS, but it was also amazing as experience for us that we discovered that we, we cannot really do it in terms that it's so impossible to get inside such a person's mind, head, you know, because we're all the time thinking uh, from the perspective of person who is fully functioning. We don't have a perspective of a person who is not functioning since birth. So very quickly we started to kind of rotate around this person. So at the end we ended up with three main protagonists. So the CCS person who has this big secret which we really cannot dive into because I think from her perspective or his perspective, it's not as terrifying as it's from the perspective of a normal person. And then we, we, we brought two main protagonists. So it's like the person he loves in love with and his mother with him, he has of course a, a special bond. So like, it was also very interesting for us, the whole process of, of, of script writing this thing. How long did it take to write the script to a point where you were pretty satisfied with the 
with the draft that you had? Oh, it was a long process. <laughs> it was a long process, but it was not a continuous process. We, we made uh, also other things in between. Also, like our son at that time, of course, uh, we had to concentrate a lot of him. So it was much longer than it should have been, but I'm glad it took so, so long because then you have a very perspective, you know, it's always like that. So you, you want to finish as soon as possible, but then when you like, you know, leave it for a few months, come back to it later, you have another perspective and you are more eager to change and make radical changes that you would never have got to do earlier. So to be honest, I don't know. I think we started writing this soon after our curse, a kind of, I don't know, maybe 2015, 14, something like that. And the film was ready in 2019. So it took us a bit. But uh, at the end, you know, I was very angry that it took so long because the whole production process also took so long for many reasons, personal, not personal and so on. But at the end, I'm, I'm happy with the result and it, it must have been that way, no other. We've got a wonderful question from Mia over on the q and I'm gonna put this question to, I guess, to each of you as a general enough question that you could each answer this. But uh, Chris, uh, if, if you wanna, answer the question, this would be awesome, Chris and, and Sidney. Uh, what is the biggest challenge you had while filming? And I'll add a little bit of a spin to it to make it a little bit positive too. What is the biggest challenge that when you look at it now really fills you with satisfaction and contentment that you overcame that challenge? What else? <laughs> yeah, you start then I go. Oh. Um, the biggest satisfaction for me in the Maurer movie is, of course, I'm the DOP. I, I, I'm happy that with working together, my wife was so perfect. And we made a, for me, a wonderful movie. I like to see in the cinema myself because I like this kind of movies and the locations were perfect for us. And for me, as a cinematographer, it was very uh, fulfilling to, to work there in a different country with a different culture with other people. And I love this very much. And each time I, I see this movie, I can see all those little parts we, we, we made and sometimes kind of improvised everything and everything came in our hands like we wanted to have it sometimes by accident. And this is very nice to see in the back, uh, back, back then. And having made every, uh, giving all the challenges we had to, with our little budget we had, with our, our funds to, to, to create this, this 106 minutes movie. So just pretty much like <laughs> this, yes. Yes, and I'm also so happy. Um... I wrote the script alone. I was not sure about myself, how I will continue and how this movie will come out. I was always taking notes around, but I never had experience before uh, written script form coming out as a performance. And I was always wondering, how can I give this emotions? I mean, I'm so happy it came out exactly uh, more than I expected. I think it was a good communication. And I think I felt the feeling of the independent filmmaking is very strong. I mean, uh, when you go inside of it one time, you want to make it more, I think. And is there one particular scene that, that when you watch, you can watch it a, a hundred, a thousand times and, and it's still, you see something different a little bit each time? Um, when I'm editing, uh, it, it was the same for me. It, editing time took very long time. It was a one, uh, I edited fast, but post-production time one year and I was watching all the time. Last year we start we started to send film festivals and I had chance to see the movie in the big screen first time. I mean I watched thousand times and editing time okay but when I saw it in the big screen it felt like mm -hmm. so, I'm watching something new. <laughs> That's why I think I'm not getting bored of it. I'm um, happy. Um, some scenes I have, some scenes about uh, feelings uh, about missing parents. Our character he's dreaming his parents. And he, you, uh, you have, a, you can have a feeling about uh, when you don't have a family. This emptiness. I think I like the scenes watching again, and it makes me always emotional. <laughs> yeah. Love it, and that is a nice segue into a question that we had over on the chat from Juan Pablo. Asks uh, Chris and and Sivgi, uh, how was the casting process of Top mm -hmm. Rock? Yes. Uh, 
When I'm writing the story, I was already dreaming one actor from Istanbul. I met him before in my city in Antalya, in Turkey. But uh, I didn't meet him like a film way. He was just my uh, teacher's friend and in the one room just saying hi to each other. But for me, it was difficult to give him a script and uh, try to ask him, do you like to act in my movie? Um, because I was not sure about how uh, famous or known people reacting that kind of things. Uh, from other side, my another and my another character is my own cousin. I got inspiration from him. I want him to act in this movie, but I was not sure that he can act it. I mean, he can learn dialogues or how he will perform. And the third thing was, I was not sure, even if I convinced the Istanbul famous actor, can I put my uh, cousin together and one professional, one unprofessional, can I convince them to act together? That's why it was very uh, exciting process. I sent the script. He sent me an email some weeks later. I'm so lucky that he said he liked the story so much. He just said, I don't have an expectation. I have a feeling for the story. I'm coming with my own car from Istanbul to your city. We are making this movie. Then in this time, it was the right time for me. I told him that uh, I test my cousin. He wants to be an actor and he has so much feelings about this film. And I need a character from who's, who lives in village town. That's why I'm thinking my cousin will act the second character. So the like main character, he just said, like, I think it will be so good. <laughs> it will be very natural. Uh, someone from village town, it will give the right feelings. We will handle it. It was a very beautiful time for me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious, as, as a couple working together and finding one another's roles, uh, Chris, how, do you, how did you process uh, being the cinematographer? Uh, and what happens when you had conflicts or if there were conflicts? Yeah, how do you, how do you resolve them in a way that's very professional? And then you've got to go home and, and I'm sure some of this stuff carries over to the house, you know? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't get too loud because all the family was around. <laughs> no, um, I think it was, we had our tensions, of course. We, we didn't have so much budget. We didn't have so much time. It was, everything was, everything together. We didn't have our free time where we can go alone because we were waking up in the morning, we were driving to the set, um, we were working all day and coming back home and, and eating and going to bed. So it was a uh, very um, exhausting time, but a very fulfilling time too. And it was really, um, really good to do this, I think. I mean, okay, one thing, this, this translation of the script, I would like <laughs> would have liked a little bit better because she forgot to translate it into my language or into, into English. So I knew not everything of the movie, I must admit. <laughs> so it was a little bit difficult for me sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking it's bad, okay. I'm, I'm agreeing that I didn't translate the complete script, uh, just the 25 page I translated because I was so excited to make this movie. And I told him that I will translate it until the shooting day. And he he, he was not uh, seeing ready script. And I was explaining always, we are shooting this one and this one. Uh, I felt bad until this time, but right now I'm feeling better because I think now he can trust me for our next project that we can make a movie. <laughs> yeah, I will give you. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris takes direction well, is what you're saying. Yes, I think it was, um, it was everything very spontaneous. It was on the fly a little bit. We didn't have so much planning. Um, we just came to the set and that's the, and we had, we had some problems getting locations and time. So it was always shooting and then going to another location we had and it worked out everything fine. But it's difficult, of course, when you don't have a complete plan of everything and only in the editing process, when the subtitles came, <laughs> I understood the movie completely. So yeah, it was an adventure. Such a wonderful story. We have a question uh, from a viewer, John, who asks, is Toprak a story about <clears throat> contemporary Turkey, specifically the conflict between the old ways and those who want to change in a new direction? Very beautiful question. Um, 
So I come from Turkey, from Antalya, from city part. My, but my grandparents are living in the village town. And when we are visiting them from my childhood, I always hear the conversation about how they are thinking, their mentality. It was normal to me. It was just like natural to me. But after our marriage, I moved to Germany. Last five years, I live in Munich. So it started to come different to me because German people are not like uh, how my parents are talking in the village town. And when I started to uh, uh, travel in other countries, I understood the mentality of the, I started to understand different world. Then I re realized, oh, we have a different understanding and we are living presented uh, our religion, culture and tradition. That's why I wanted to write this story. And do I want to change something? Uh, I would like to change so many things uh, about female rights, how a little bit about uh, tradition, culture, maybe positive pay, but it's not possible. That's why I wanted to put the real characters from village town to explain and understand actually they are not a bad people, but they are living like this in their life. So I wanted to um, show this, share this story with another side of the countries. <laughs> So that's such, such a great answer. Uh, now I want to visit Turkey. I absolutely have to go. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, do any of y'all have questions for one another? Do you have questions about one another's films? Feel free to jump in at any point. We can make this more of a, a round table discussion than a... Um, I, 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 can I ask a couple of things? I, I was interested in uh, one thing Tomas said when he talked about uh, the lens being like therapy. Um, and I felt like, I wonder if all, all, all of us, all, all four of us have a, some sort of a parallel there because each story seems to have uh, obviously come from our own personal history in some form. And uh, when you said that, it really resonated with me because it's in a way, because my stories, as well as Tomaz, about uh, secret mental health issues and trying to live a society without telling the world what, what's going on behind uh, behind your facade, in a way. So um, I think I just wanted to sort of acknowledge what you said there when you talked about the lens of therapy and maybe how you both in Germany felt that does that work for you as well, that statement? Is there a therapeutic angle to when you're making your film and it has that kind of um, personal connection? Can you start? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think it's, there's a difference between a cinematographer and a director, I guess, because I'm telling her story in my pictures. So it's, I think it's different for me. Um, I'm, trying to make her me happy with the pictures. So of course the lens is, I am the lens kind of, but she's the director and she tells me what to do. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can, I can answer this question so well. Um, maybe I, I didn't understand very well everything. <laughs> I think I was just saying, does it feel like a, a does it feel like a bit of therapy when we're telling these stories? I mean, how for, for you, for you and Tomas, mm -hmm. was there a more of a clarity afterwards? Mm -hmm. Yes, it kind of gives to me because I'm coming this from this tradition. Yes. I I just live like this, and it's it was very interesting point for me that after I recognized it and I started to look from another perspective, it was kind of like this the point for me to learn oh wow, that could be a story and maybe that could be a really good film also in the filmmaking um, process too. Um, but sometimes some people are asking me that do you like to change really things around and so on. I think uh, I cannot change, <laughs> but I can make movies about them and I can put the stories out, out of the... Uh, out of the country to share another people and sh show about it. I wanted to make a, for example, this um, gay, lesbian stuff subjects are not so usual in my country. I would like to go for it too. Uh, I was thinking maybe it could be a little bit easier to make that kind of movies, but 
I experienced right now in Turkey, if you want to make a movie, they are asking you, uh, you need to get a permission what kind of topic should be inside. And they want to change the, they want to control the story. They asked me a thousand times, is there any, um, anything about the government against the government, anything about political stuff? I said, no, no, no. And I'm still afraid right now that I make something wrong. And it's sometimes the feeling not uh, sure about what I made. Uh, some subjects will be difficult. I would like to make it like a therapy, my movies, you're right, but maybe uh, I need to try from another side of the way. Did you, did you feel better about it or Tomaz after you made this film and, and your son's not better, but did it give you some clarity when you speak about therapy? Uh, I think, yes. To, I, was, uh, I was asking Tomaz because he... Uh, uh, Either <clears throat> well, I, I, as I told, like I felt this inner feeling that I had to do this movie, and somehow I felt relief that I did it, and I'm uh, happy the way I ended up. It ended up like it was like like I planned, or even like better than I planned. Um, yes, I think like. I think it depends on on people and why you tell stories. Like I think in in every. I always felt that you take the story, uh, we tell stories to somehow take out something which is inside us to, I don't know, process it somehow in, in a way. Uh, so always there are personal stories which are very thera therapeutic. I think the art is therapeutic, like if it wouldn't give you any benefits as a creator, why would you do it? Like, you know, non so it's always a kind of process. In our my case, of course, it's very like therapeutic in a way that it's really happened to me. So this is really my personal story. But I think always we somehow take some, you know, personal feelings, personal emotions, which we have to somehow really free process through our characters, through, you know, looking at it from different angles. So I think it's always a kind of thing in, in, in movie making. Uh, of course, sometimes you make movies just feel pure, you know, um, there are craft movies you make for entertainment and so on, but mostly the stories if it's a personal story, so it's always a kind of therapeutic feeling, I, I guess. But I remember, sorry, I just, just will finish. I remember when I finished my, uh, not on Dean, but the first uh, film, Our Curse, and for example, in Poland, people are not really used to talking, to talk about personal stories. And they didn't know how to react because it's a very personal story. So they didn't know what to say. Are they allowed to make their comments about the film because it's a personal story? And they said like, well, this film is too personal. <laughs> it was amazing for me. And then I started to travel around the world. And I know we had a premiere in Locarno and they said like, and I told them about this thing. They said, how a film can be too personal? It can be not personal enough, but it can be too personal. But of course, it's also a matter of society, you know, and, um, you know, many things. Cultural, yeah. <laughs> and if I can jump in, I'll talk just a little bit about Eddie and Sunny, uh, which was originally a, a short story that I wrote back in 2012. Um, and I wrote it just purely for publication purposes. Uh, and then I got a, I won some awards and it got published in a small magazine uh, here in the US. Um, and then became, with that support, I said, well, I want to turn this thing into a novel. It makes sense to, to expand the story into a novel. And the, uh, to your question, Raffaello, the story began because a good friend of mine who is, was a bit of a mentor to me, he's about 15 years older than me, asked me to work on a public service announcement for a homeless shelter in North Carolina, which is kind of in the mid-Atlantic states in the United States. Um, and I had a very limited view of what homelessness meant. Typically in the US, I thought of homelessness as a guy coming up to me on the street corner asking for change or having a sign and he wanted some money. And so when we did this public service announcement, which was to spread the word about the, the homeless shelter in, in North Carolina, uh, I saw a very different side to homelessness. And I remember vividly, and I'll never forget, 
one of the interviews we did, we walked into a dormitory that had about 40 bunk beds in it. And all the bunk beds were empty, except in the back right corner of the room, there was a young girl who was probably about 13. And she was doing her algebra homework, sitting on her bunk bed. And that my friend who had asked me to act as a cinematographer and, and lighting and gaffer and this sort of thing, said, go over and set up the camera. And so, you know, I was chatting with her as, as I was doing all this. And I realized in that moment, she was just doing her homework for school the next day. And her mother was out looking for work and had no place, they had no place to stay. And so they were staying in the shelter as a mother and daughter. And it completely upended my very narrow view of what homelessness is. Uh, and so back to your question, I think I, I decided, okay, this is a subject matter that I don't know a lot about that I want to learn about and process. And in my case, anyways, I think creatively, if there's a like a sociological issue that's really complicated, there's not a black or white answer to how to solve it. Creativity is the way that I process those things that are really, really complicated to, to, to process. And I, and I suppose if I've learned anything in this nearly decade since the short story began to now seeing the film um, in post-production uh, is to have more empathy and compassion and to go out of my way to extend compassion to someone who's in that sort of desperate situation uh, and to not be afraid. I think there's a lot of fear in our country, in the US, United States, there's a lot of fear around homelessness for good reason. I'm, I mean, I can understand if you're a, a single woman and, you know, uh, and someone comes up to you and asks you for money. And uh, I mean, I can understand some, some, some of that tension. Uh, and perhaps it's a privilege that I have just based on, on who I am. But I found that just asking people about their stories, because um, everybody has a story, how they came to be homeless. Uh, if they're, if they're, if their mental faculties are such that you can ask them. Uh, and so I think ultimately it just, it helped me to become more empathetic, more compassionate. Um, just by observing, just by yeah. learning to observe rather than judge it from a subconscious uh, level immediately when someone comes up to you and asks for money. But with, when you decided to take that on, I guess, with the camera, or in any way, you became an observer and you sort of, that makes you more compassionate, I think. Yeah, and, and the novel is, a, it's about a family. Uh, it's a, there's a couple and they have a young son who's about seven in the novel. Um, and, and so I had to imagine what it would be like to, and I'm, I'm also a parent myself, so I had to imagine what it would be like if I was th in that desperate of a situation where they're living out of their car they're living from paycheck to paycheck, trying to get a job here and there. And uh, they run afoul of the law uh, in the first act of the story. And so, and so what I wanted to do is humanize these characters, right? It's very easy to just sort of, you know, put people in a box and say, well, this person's not trying or whatever. Uh, and I think the stories are much, much more complicated. And um, they're much more complicated than that. Someone doesn't just end up on the street because they can't get work. Um, there's, there's often a lot of different factors that go into that. And then when you bring families into the situation, uh, it, it's, really, it's really complicated. Uh, but all of it, I think, how I made meaning from it, the therapy of it, if you will, uh, was, was learning to just be a little bit more humane, trying to make our world a little bit better place and, and try to spread that uh, as you were doing, Tomas, as you're describing with your story, so that other people can empathize as well and can see this, this story that they may not have thought about from that perspective before. Um, and it's a tough line to walk because you don't want to you don't want to preach to people. You don't want it to be an agenda. Uh, it has to be an entertaining story, ultimately, and something that carries people away. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about that. So how do you balance you know, telling both an entertaining story and, you know, not necessarily um, making it too political or does that matter to you? Do you want to make it political? <laughs> uh, how about with, 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 top, with top Rock, uh, Sevgi and Chris? So there was a one scene, um, Kidney Selling. 
So selling your organ for living. Um, in our movie, the main character should have to sell his kidney for going from village town to city center for the operation. Of his mother. For his mo uh, mother. So some people ask me, like, uh, the hospital, it's not just like easy to go like this. So that was the one of the a true story my grandmother gets uh, she had a kidney problem and she had to go to hospital and the same issue came out so she had to say, pay some money and she has to go to city center by car um, I'm trying to not make it a political but it's happened like this and I wanted to put it inside of the story and if you use it this subject inside of the story it's coming out as a political it's a difficult question um, I don't know I don't know what else I can add on it, but uh, I'm not going, I, I'm not trying to make a political view. I try to show it from the human way, uh, your responsibilities or life is bringing you one point and you have to make a decision. From this side, I try to make it. Um, if it is going political, I think uh, right now it's movies going all around of the world and so many people commenting about it. Uh, I think it doesn't matter right now in this point anymore to me. <laughs> I think, well, I think it's a, a lovely point. I mean, ultimately, for it sounds like for all of us, the stories are about a character and it is, it's about relating to those characters. Yeah. There's a wonderful question over in the chat that John asks, uh, could each of the filmmakers summarize the status of independent film in their home countries? And if they have been, if they have filmed in the US, what are some of the big differences between filming uh, in the United States and in your home country. So could you describe a little bit about what the status of independent filmmaking is in, in your home country? And maybe Chris, if you and Sophie want to start with that, that'd be awesome. Okay. I mean, I'm German, she's Turkish. So we are working in Germany. She could talk, talk about Turkey maybe. In Germany, we have some independent movies. I just finished a, a horror feature. We shot in the night with no budget. So it's, it's there. I think the main difference between Germany and uh, America is that we have much lower budgets, I guess. So we have to deal with smaller teams, less days, etc. And it is, I think it's a different kind of um, shooting, um, how, what you can af afford here and do. And in our movie, we had no budget too. So I think it's this main difference. And the funds you have in Germany, you can get state funds. It's a difficult to get. And in America, I think it's a lot of private investors are, are helping you. And in Germany, we don't have this so much, I think. So you're always um, relating to, to the state funds or TV channels who are helping you. Yeah, or you make it on your own funds, but it's a little bit more difficult. So I think this is the main difference between Germany and America. Yes, and in my country, uh... Being film female filmmaker is not like, uh, I think not like same in USA, I think. When I wanted to make a movie, people was asking, why do you make this? Why do you need to do this? I was going to make, I was going to ask for the permission and they were not understanding that independent person can make a movie. They were asking all the time this production company. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned it from this a lot. And when we went to village town, of course, I was not expecting people to get ready to cameras and lights putting around and they will say like, everything is fine. Of course, they asked so many questions and I had to answer. I think it was a beautiful experience. Um, but when I was in LA, I met some film people. I met some young female directors and I loved how they are finding their budgets and they are making their short films and feature films. Uh, and when I listened to their experience, it was not like how I had it. That's why, <laughs> that's why it's not comparable, I think. Well, and I should say too, Eddie and Sonny was filmed in Italy and we went to Italy to, well, I, I wasn't really part of the filmmaking team. I worked on the screenplay and the novel, uh, but part of why they filmed in Italy was some of the tax incentives. There were enormous tax incentives that the government in Italy uh, provided uh, and there was some tension too about that as well. Like they had to be, there was, they have a, a tax credit system where you have a certain number of points for each person involved in the film and you can only have so many points to, to get the 30 or 40% tax credit or whatever it is. Uh, 
and then there were EU members as well, and that you get a point for that or something. Uh, I wonder, uh, Chris, is that is that similar in Germany? Are there tax incentives that the government provides for for filming in Germany? Um, I never tried to get this kind of funds. I just heard about this. For next, we will try this. So we have this kind of in um, each state of Germany, like we are in Bavaria. If you shoot in Bavaria, you can get from Bavaria this funds. If you want another fund, you have to shoot a little bit there, or you have some people from from Northern Westphalia from another country. So it is it's kind of messed up, I guess, because if you need one million euro to make a movie and you just get two hundred thousand here and get there and there and there, you have to shoot there some days or you have to get some people from there on this from this city or somewhere it's it's not very flexible i think so you can do this like this but it takes time to to get everything together and this is what i can experience from other people who need years to to finance their movie this way and for me it's a little bit frustrating to see this because i don't want to spend five years I'm making one movie and to finance it, I want to make it quicker, I guess. Um, so it can work here, but I don't like it. <laughs> and, and Tomas, how, how about your experience? Now, did you film, was it, did you film in Poland? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, I filmed in Poland. Well, more or less, it looks the same like uh, in Germany, what Chris said. Of course, with uh, of course, it changes unfortunately nowadays because our Polish film fund is more and more government controlled. So the subject and everything is more controlled. So it's not so easy to make films like it was in the past, uh, unfortunately. So we're coming back to the old ages, middle ages somehow. Uh, but the whole idea is like there are state funds which is also, of course, difficult to get. And sometimes you don't know why you get them because, you know, different... The, com the, com uh, the commission which judges which project to select changes every year. So it also depends uh, who is at that year and so on. You know. So it's quite difficult. And uh, the original funds, mm, private investors are just for purely commercial films. Uh, so so as far as like, no, I think purely independent filmmaking is when you are a student at film school, <laughs> because then it's also for student works, everyone can work for free because everyone is kind of student or they know it's student work. Once you finish school, then, well, you have to pay people, you know, well, of course, well, you have to have some money. You cannot shoot with no budget because shooting with no budget me means not paying people money. And, you know, I, even in case of Odin, because, uh, it was a short, so it got funds for short, or a typical short. So we didn't have enough money for such a long film. And it was really, I felt really bad that we had to ask people to take less money uh, than they usually do uh, to take part in our film, you know? And we, so well, you know, you are not really, you always have money to pay people at least. And I would like to, you know, of course don't, don't have, big budget, but at least such budget that you can satisfy, you know, the, the basic salaries, because otherwise it's, everyone is there while we have to learn his living. And documentaries, Raphael. sorry, I just said the documentaries, of course, are different, you know, in, in a ways, but then no one earns from documentaries, so it's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Raffaello, I know we're just a little over time. I'll bring it to a close in the next five minutes or so. Uh, but tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, um, I, I've, I've got to say, I think, you know, obviously the, the spectrum of independent film worldwide is huge. And as you both all said, you can make a film for a very low budget uh, and you can make an indie film for a few, few million or a hundred thousand. Mine in the end cost probably around fifty thousand dollars. I didn't expect it to be that much, but thankfully I found an investor from the United States who'd been interested in my work, and he slowly became more and more involved. And thankfully for him, uh, Bill was it the, the film was finished. Um, but I must say, the British government—I didn't know this was coming—but at the end, I was able to accumulate my costs 
and we sent us, uh, we filled out a form. I had someone fill it out for me for 180 pounds. We got British certification with the, the same way you were talking about a certain amount of points, and cultural points. And I think I just got over 20% back of our budget, which was fantastic, which I was able to use in the film. Uh, so the, the, the support at the moment feels like it's there in the UK for even a uh, low budget independent film, um, providing you can you know have track of your costs and it's legitimate and it's a British cultural film they will support you the 20, 25% that you're, uh, that's available to you should you tick all the boxes. So I think that's amazing for me because I didn't even anticipate that until I got to the end. And someone said, you know, you can apply for this with British, uh, get British certification and then with the tax department, send in the certification for your costs and we got 25% or 20, 25% back, whatever it was. So I was really delighted about that. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. Uh, and finally, there's a question kind of related to this from Juan Pablo. This may be our last question. Um, let's talk a little bit about distribution and how the distribution model of films has changed some of the things that are similar. Um, you know, this, with Eddie and Sonny, we're talking about film festivals. Um, Venice is a big one that we're talking about, Toronto. Uh, and but then from there, you know, is, are we going theatrical? And then you have to think about the pandemic and how that has affected theatrical releases. Um, as an independent filmmaker, is the what do you, what do you in an ideal world? What do you hope your distribution flow will be? And Raffaello, why don't you get us started with that? Um, well, again, I was really pleased to uh, be offered the distribution sort of a distribution, excuse me, distribution deal through a film festival. And I was approached by a distributor 1091 Media and we looked into it and it seemed good. And it's like, it's out there on the platforms, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, which again was unexpected. Um, so, I mean, it's never been more easy or e it's easier to get your independent film seen now, or at least put on a platform. Getting it seen requires a whole different uh, organization, operation. People will not firstly see your film unless they know it exists. And secondly, if it exists, what's the talk about it? So how do you master that? Because I've got to the point where I, you know, gave my heart to this film and I didn't think about money whilst I was making it because it doesn't, it doesn't really affect a creator. Mm -hmm. There's many more issues. Then you reach the end and it's out there and you think, right, wouldn't it be nice to have a check arrive at some point <laughs> to make it all worthwhile and we can all eat together. Mm -hmm. um, so that is another, I would say, very important lesson to have at film school, which is once you've made your product and you're happy with it, and you get it out to the festivals and etc. How do we do our very best now to get perhaps some revenue back for ourselves, not just the distributors? That's my end note. I love it. It's a, it's a great it's a great point to make. I think so for so many first time independent filmmakers, it's just can we even get this film made? Right? It's can we get it done and get it completed? Um, and, and distribution will just come whenever it comes. But I think once you've made that first film, then you're beginning to think about these other aspects of, of, the, of the profession and the process for sure. Uh, Chris uh, and, and, and Sevgi, how about you? Uh, is, is the word distribution, what does, what does it mean to you and what do you see as your flow going forward uh, for, for Top Rock? I agree and I join everything what Rafaela said. <laughs> As a uh, new filmmaker, actually, I didn't think distribution side exactly. I made this movie with my heart, and I it was not uh, for the money making out. 
it was very important for me this story is not staying inside of my country not in my city it's getting out of the world and i'm so happy and thankful again i'm saying thank you very much for including us your film festival and as a new filmmaker giving us chance to show this film around of the uh, world around of the usa so that was the first thing what i learned it everything happened step by step Without asking distribution part, it just came itself right now. After the film festivals, after you getting some prize, um, we got. We are hoping to have a distribution in Germany right now. We got some interest. Um, we have a contract. We have a contract. <laughs> we <laughs> have. He signed so, it. <laughs> so we have a distribution in Germany after we won a very important film festival in Germany, the Hof Filmtage. Um, we got the main prize, and then we got a little bit of attention. And this was for us a very important thing because now we have one little distribution company, it's an independent, they're trying to get funds, <laughs> state funds for this. And so they want to try to bring this movie in Germany and Switzerland and Austria to the cinema when the cinema is opening again and when they're still alive until then. Yeah, I think there's some kind of ifs inside of the sentence, but um, distribution is possible and I, I, I love cinema. I don't want to watch a movie on this little screen here. <laughs> so I hope that our movie is going to cinema and I hope I will see a lot of other movies again in a big screen because this is what I make cinema for, a movie for, and to, to have this on the big screen. Um, and uh, after this question, everybody answered, I would like to ask one question about how much important for uh, the filmmakers, film school, or is it important for them to go in film school or not go in film school? As uh, I am asking this question without having a film school experience, uh, I feel myself always missing and I would like to ask this question, how important and how did they handle in their movies? It's a great question. Um, you, can I quickly answer that, Stacey, is that all right? Uh, I would say, look, even as an actor, when you go to a drama school, it's not just the benefit of learning a, a craft, it's a place where you can bounce ideas around and that's very important as we are here today. I think a place to mix with others is as important as learning a particular craft. You can learn that craft through experience, there's no question. You don't need to go to a film school, but either way, there's a root of learning new things and I think it's always good to be around like-minded people because you start to figure out who you are as a filmmaker and as, a, um, as, a, as an artist of any sort. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that personally. I think uh, from what I've seen and, and Raffaello maybe you would agree with this to some degree, Tomas as well, I'm not sure. But one of the things that I think a film school can do is it can provide a space where you can network you're immersed with other filmmakers other creatives and how many stories have we heard of of people building relationships through that kind of uh, experience that then end up lasting a lifetime do you necessarily have to do it that way no but that's a ready-made way that I think that you can kind of immerse yourself with like-minded people for sure Absolutely. Yes, I agree also. I went to film school very late because before I was doing something completely different. I was IT consultant and then I decided to leave it all and go to the film school. And yes, I think, well, you can do the film school. It gives you craft. It gives you kind of basic networking, you know, something where you can start. But at the moment you have to stop listening to people other and do your own thing because I, I've met I, I know there are many people who got lost you know in film schools because they started their films became academic you know they followed too much of the principles of filmmaking and there are no principles you have to know the basis but then do whatever it's in your soul that's a wonderful place to leave the conversation thank you all for participating in this euro filmmakers panel and for everybody that has been watching over on facebook and through the zoom chat thank you all for tuning in you had some wonderful questions uh, if there were questions that you wanted to ask that weren't answered during the uh, live session here i'm sure the filmmakers would be happy to to chat with you via email or maybe you can look them up on social media or something of that nature thank you all very much
and best of luck with your films at the 2021 Arizona International Film Festival. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's it. <laughs>